two apologies if that's okay. So thank you first of all to all of you, one for, for attending, but also for the number of you who helped with the, the survey. Um, beforehand, it meant we had some live data um, to talk about rather than just hypothetical theorizing about values within um, business organizations. So that was really useful. And thank you for, for doing that. Um, in total, 48 people completed the service from different organizations and companies. Um, many of whom apologized, they couldn't make it to the business breakfast, but they wanted to have a follow-up conversation about their own organization and their own values within their organization. So a huge thank you to you for, for doing that. Thank you to, to Gronia for helping as well in terms of communication and, and keeping us updated. Two apologies. Um, for, first of all, because it's such live data, I was working with the presentation on the train coming up from Manchester yesterday, so it's, it's literally lifted straight out of the um, Survey Monkey site and, and popped onto a PowerPoint. It's really not as polished as I'd like it to be, um, but it means we've got live data to, to have a discussion about this morning. Um, so that's the first apology. The second apology is um, the the purpose of this event was a blog post that I wrote for the Business School um, blog called Leading by Tweeting. And I just noticed a sense of the number of leaders who were demonstrating their leadership online. It seemed to be a, a new phenomenon that was starting to happen. So I, I, I put a sort of speculative blog post out, which lo and behold ended up one of the highest hits on the Business School's blog post. Um, which I thought was really interesting because it wasn't um, from the research at this point, it was just speculative. Um, observing a few trends. And um, whilst we are going to talk about that today, I want to set it against a basis about values within organisations rather than just talking about the leading by tweeting. Now, I hope at this point half of you don't walk in and say, I only wanted to hear about Twitter. Um, I hope that you're all able to see that it's set in that sort of values based um, construct. We had an interesting um, conversation recently about a NATO commander who came to give some presentations and also to speak to some students. And all he wanted to do was to talk to the students about international relations theory. All the students wanted to talk about was Afghanistan. So I hope it's not the same today where people want to talk about Twitter. I have to say, no, no, we want to say that again, some theoretical construct of, of, um, of, of values. So I thought we'd touch on three different areas. We'd, we'd look a little bit at values-based leadership. We look at what was in the survey in terms of organisational and, and personal values, and then we'll come on to the, the, the star attraction, if you like, of Twitter and social media. So um, all of my interest in this started um, when I was working with this gentleman here, Kevin Murphy. Um, Kevin and I both went to university together, um, continued working on a, a variety of projects together. He now works in cybersecurity, and I think he's just moved from RBS to Lloyd's um, recently. Um, so heavily involved in the, in, in the world of business. But both of us came out of university, I, I can't believe I'm going to say this as an employee of a university, and say, wasn't university great, but it didn't really provide us with the skills for the workplace. Uh, that's changed, there's no doubt that's changed since we were in university. Aberdeen is an example, the way in which graduate attributes filter through course design, assessments, is far, far greater. But at that time, we felt university was a nice thing to do for four years, but did it really get us ready for the world of work? Question mark. We really did question that. So we had a number of conversations about the skills agenda and, and how could we help to contribute to it? Was there something we could pitch in um, around about the skills agenda? And after numerous conversations of workshops, we looked at training packages, we looked at computer games, we looked at all sorts of ways in which we might support the skills agenda. One night, um, sitting at an event, we said, why don't we just go and ask some people who seem to be very successful in their sectors and strip away their education, strip away how much money they've got, strip away who their parents are, what are the raw skills that have made them a success in that sector? And we did that. That was the first book we published together called Determined to Succeed, who were in a variety of sectors use case study examples to try and get a sense of what are the skills that seem to be promoting their, their, their success within the organisation. So we produced that. The um, Interestingly, again, going back to social media and online, the paper-based copy wasn't that successful. The e-book was very successful. Most people picked it up as, as an e-book. It seemed to be a trend that was, was moving at that time. Um, so published that. At that time, um, I got invited to a, a strange meeting at the Open, and I sort of thought, if you invite to this thing here, it's not somebody's really keen to see you, somebody wants something from you. 
And it was to discuss the book. Um, a gentleman had invited me to the open and a um, long discussion about the book. And he said, Do you know this been, it's been done before? This whole format of just asking people and organisations and trying to get a sense of, of, of their success has been done before. And it was connected to Carnegie. So um, there was a gentleman uh, who observed Carnegie and was interested in Carnegie's success. And I approached Carnegie and said to him, I want to find out why is it you're such a success? And drill down into the skills that make you a success. And Carnegie had said, absolutely not, because he was always humble, he didn't want to do it. He said, well, what I want to do is to introduce you to 50 people who've inspired me, and I want you to go out and interview them and try and find out what it is that makes them successful and distill that down. And, and the book was produced. It was the start of sort of self-improvement business books. Um, so you, you start to get books that start essentially talking about that. So we decided to continue um, the work, looking at case studies, and produce a second book called The Art of Achievement. Same format again, drilling down into, into skills for success across different businesses. The only difference with that book was, as well as looking at um, current success, we asked the contributors to future gaze. What's the market going to look like in your own sector in the next 20, 25 years? And how might the skills profile change? And um, that was the only difference with our second publication. Um, and we used the Glen Eagles Eagle to launch the book, which we, we thought was quite a, a, a good symbol of success. The only problem with the Glen Eagles Eagle, we went through about 15 copies of the book, because what we wanted for the photograph was that the Glen Eagles Eagle was going to lift the book but its claws kept on going through hardback and paperback copies and almost went through Kevin's new suit for the photo launch as well, so he wasn't a happy chap on that particular day. Um, so two books in um, and, and um, lots of discussions about skills and a particular conversation sparked a different mode of inquiry and it was with a figure who many of you will recognise, Craig Wilson, um, who kindly launched um, or held the Aberdeen launch of the, um, the second book. So we always did the launches, one in the Central Belt and one in the North East. And during the conversations with Craig, Craig talked a lot about um, both his company, his company success, how it was growing, um, but also he talked about his work that he was doing with Friends of Anchor and various other cancer charities in the North East. And there was a sense of his engagement in the community and how that also propelled him on a daily basis. And obviously the story of his father, which you'll see when you go into the restaurant, he has the story of his, his father's battle with cancer. And out of that, we had a conversation that whilst the skills were successful, the underpinning thing that, that was making um, all of the individuals who we'd spoken to a success was the value base that they were operating on that they had a strong sense of their values, that had a strong sense of their organisation's values, particularly when they were business owners. And that seemed to be something that was worth further interrogation and, and, and further um, discussion. So we started to look at the theme of values. And the third publication was called Speaking of Values, where we tried to encourage individuals within organisations to have a more regular conversation about the values in the organisation. I worked with um, two other um, co-authors on, on that book. So on your left is a gentleman, Gary Walsh, um, who's a, an academic researcher, uh, particular interest in values. And in the middle is Dr Emma Fossey, um, who spent many years um, as Her Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary. Um, so a very different slam, but had an academic background before that. <laughs> And again, we use a similar um, approach where we use case studies to look at different individuals and to try and work out what, what was our value base. For many, they found that really hard, particularly Scots in Scotland, because we don't tend to wear our values on our sleeve. We don't tend to talk about our values. It's not something that we promote or have a regular discussion about. It's something that's got a difficult discussion um, to, to have. So that, that's a sort of background to um, the where I, where I was interested and got into um, values. So we're going to run through a um, short presentation, but largely focusing on the questionnaire and trying to draw out some, some, some um, examples from the questionnaire that may be of, of, of interest to you. 
Um, my own background um, in this, I started life as a history educator. Um, I, I worked in secondary schools, mainly in the central belt, before getting promoted um, if you like, through the system of education and moving into educational leadership. Um, my most recent roles in education um, were working between education and the business sector, trying to forge links between them. Some of you will know about the developing young workforce agenda. The precursor to that was a policy called Determined to Succeed. We stole the policy name for the title of our, our, our book. Um, we worked on that agenda of trying to bring education and business um, closer together. Um, I was very grateful to um, Scottish Business News um, for, for including me in their 40 under 40 list um, two years ago now. Um, and then I moved into the higher education sector where we now run um, leadership courses across the public sector. So we not only have educational leaders, we have police, <coughs> NHS, military leaders, all working together, looking at leadership in, in their sectors. Um, so a broad range of, 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 of inputs and interests um, in my own career, and a number of non-executive director posts as well, um, where I can feed in my, my knowledge and work and values. Um, the importance of values, um, we all know in terms of organisations, but usually what we find is organisations give more time to thinking about the vision and the aims of the organisation. Sometimes the values is almost done as a cursory extra. We need to talk about our values. And it doesn't get the same amount of thought and scrutiny um, when we're put together. But we can see how important values are um, at the outset of setting up organisations and setting up project teams, for example. Definitions are clearly um, important to us as an academic sphere, um, and sometimes we get them mixed up. Sometimes um, values, virtues, and ethics gets mixed up. But more regularly, I see on um, companies that so go into receptions of companies and I see their values up. And sometimes what they've got as a value isn't a value, it's an aim. And sometimes it's not a value, it's a behaviour. So sometimes they get muddled up in terms of how they present um, the, the, the values in the corporate. Um, branding, etc. So through our, our academic study, we, we, we look at values through a number of, of different lenses to try and get a better understanding of um, values. Clearly our own personal values are important. And as I said before, it's not something we talk about regularly. We tend just to, to, to get on with life. But actually when we stop and think, what are our values? It can sometimes be quite a challenging exercise to do that. Um, we look at it clearly through organisational values, the organisation you're working in, but also other organisations to look at similarities and, and differences. Um, historical perspectives, our values change, our organisational values change, um, um, sometimes quite rapidly, um, sometimes um, more, more progressive through time. And then looking at international perspectives, particularly in a global market, um, because what may be our values sitting here in Scotland may not necessarily be the values of the different companies or the different suppliers and customers we're working with. And then we also look at academic frameworks, often not considered and interesting in the questionnaire. Most um, organisations said they looked at no other frameworks to come up with their own values. They just came up with them based in their own vacuum. They didn't look at anything else to try and um, consider um, the values of their organisation. So when we were doing the initial work on, on, on um, speaking of values book, we were just taking personal narrative. It's all about personal narrative, all about um, organisations' values. But the main um, academic framework that we use was a gentleman called Shalom Schwartz, who's probably done the most research into um, values frameworks. So he's pulled together all um, different countries and tried to look at an international values framework. And that's how he's presented it. He's presented it as a mind map of a range of different values. It's interesting to use that and get your company's values and see, are they on there? And my name thinks that excellence is not a value. It's an interesting corporate word, but it's not a value. And sometimes, as I said, behaviours get muddled up and get mixed up um, in um, the, the corporate values. One of the things that Schwartz is really big on is that there's no hierarchy in this. But if he's clustered them into groups, there's none of them are better or worse than any other. 
And you can start to see some international examples in there, which helps you to understand things in, in, in lots of ways. So, for example, um, if we mention Donald Trump, in a leadership lecture, we mentioned Donald Trump um, this early on. Um, there's sometimes um, there's been discussions about he would probably sit in this sphere here. He would be about achievement, he'd be about hedonism, and he would be about his own self stimulation. That's the sort of things he would be involved in. It doesn't mean his values are any better or any worse, they're just different values. And we can start to see where you would pitch yourself in it. And you can maybe start to see people in your organisation or other organisations you work with that maybe sit on a different part of the values framework. They're not better, they're not worse, they're just different. They're just a different set of values. And you can see both international differences but also personal differences um, when you start to go through it. And it's always interesting people to think, where do I sit on that? What are the things that strike most of it? A few folk are nodding, a few folk it, 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 it's, it's something that obviously um, speaks to people and they can see where they sit on it. So as we said, non-hierarchical, non-competitive. Our biggest um, finding from the work is rather than spending all the time trying to get the values up onto the wall, it'd be better to have a regular discussion within teams, within um, senior management teams, executive teams about values, not to come to some conclusions what they are, but just to have a regular dialogue about the values and how that's changing in an organisation. One of the organisations we, we worked with, I think, summed it up brilliantly, um, where she had said after the sessions, what we're trying to do is get to the point which lived, not laminated. But I thought that was an absolutely perfect statement. And it, certainly in the, the QI work that I do, I go into organisations and I see it up on the wall and it's blithely ignored. I also see other organisations where there's no corporate values in the wall, but you just get a feel when you're in the organisation, it's a values-led organisation. You get that sixth sense as, you, as you're speaking to people. So those are sort of recommendations that came out from that work with, with Swartz. Um, so, questionnaire um, itself, let's, let's run through the questionnaire itself. Um, we asked the usual ethics question at first, that everyone was, was okay with, with, with the work possibly being used, A, for this morning, but also possibly for, for an academic paper. Um, the Chamber of Commerce are really keen to, to publish some of the findings of it in their magazine. And thankfully, everyone who completed the survey said yes. So, so that's a big tick. We, we did our values bit and our um, e ethics part. Everyone was quite happy for the work to be shared. Um, we had a broad range um, of, 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 of inputs, um, as, as you'll see. A good balance of, of, of male-female, which was, was useful. Um, in terms of current position, um, you remember we asked you if you were currently a middle manager, currently a senior manager, currently an executive, retired middle manager, retired exec. So it was a good spread between all the different um, posts, although more business owners filled it out than anything else. So, so that was the, the spread of people who took part. In terms of length of service, the vast majority of people who are the most, uh, in terms of a table, who completed the survey have worked in business for 20 plus years. Obviously, we'd want to, to extend that data set um, o o over time. That's where we are just now. Um, most people who completed the survey did their work in Scotland, and that's, I, 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 that's where we are just now. Obviously, it'd be useful to try and build more international companies to start to get a comparator between Scottish business values and international values. That would be the aim as, as we go forward. Um, size of the business, um, again, we had a good mix in terms of the size of the business, which was, was useful to have that, that, that mix um, in the survey for today. Um, some people asked, I say that's a strange question you're asking, but we were interested to see if there was a difference between um, those who worked in the public sector um, did they have different perceptions on values? Because perhaps in the public sector there is a greater promise to talk about values um, in, in the public sector. So that was something that, that we'll use later on behind the scenes and in, in further interrogation um, of the research. And likewise, the third sector. We're interested to know if people had worked in, in the third sector before. As it happens in both, you can see um, most have spent their career in business. 
Um, that was pleasing to see that most people said that the values are um, active in the daily life of their business. But as we started to see other questions being asked, we started to see some breaks in that. People were starting to raise concerns about values within their organisation. So I was initially said, yep, yeah, we see it all the time. It did change as, as things went forward. Um, is it active in your business? Yeah, absolutely. Um, did your company have explicit values? Again, we're interested, the vast majority will say, yep, yeah, they, they, they do have explicit values. Interest at 20% don't have. And the further comments a number of people said, who had retired um, and who'd been business owners had said, we ran through our business without any values whatsoever, but actually looking back, we wonder if it would be a better place had we had regular discussions about values. So that was an interesting um, reflection for those who had, who had now left business. Um, when we started to ask about what businesses come through and what business values come through, obviously for God was the one I said to put in if you, if you didn't have any. So that was a strong one that came through. And yet um, honesty, integrity and respect come through. And some folks are shaking their head at that. Um, but that's what people had said were the, the values that came through um, in their own businesses that are operating in just now. Um, we started to ask about how the values were identified. How, how did they come about? Um, and the two strong efforts, you can't see the, the, the words there. One of them was people were saying, yes, there was a group of people who came up with them, but the counter to that, and, and, and the one that said that 40% people say it was, it was identified by management. Management just put the values in. And we see that regularly happening. Lots of discussion amongst executive teams, and then just launched into the organisation. Everyone has to follow these values. So it's worth reflecting on in terms of the, the process of, of putting our values together. Um, again, we asked the question, but asked it slightly differently. And, and the response we got again was um, management only, or some were saying yeah, it was by a, a group of people um, who came together to, to look at it. Very limited number of external support which again we thought was interesting from the point of view it's useful sometimes in something like values to have someone external working alongside you. Um, it, it, it's such a, a challenging area to work through, it's useful to have that, that external lens. Um, again, we're asking the question slightly differently, we'll do the, the deep analysis of this for the paper, but group discussion there came through as, as, as something that was quite high in terms of um, the, the, the way in which values were agreed upon. How often we review them is something that we, we continue to go um, back to people ask us, what, what is the is there optimum? I don't think there is an optimum, but I think they do need to be reviewed and, and updated on a regular basis. Um, again, interesting to see that the vast majority don't know how often they're going to be in it, and how much is that for all of our policies? How often do we update them, and do people know um, how often um, we're updating them? Of course, a lot of the work on that tends to be when there's a management takeover or a management change at executive level. Um, our current principal, his own research work is in um, leadership, um, and he talks a lot about transitioning. Um, and of course, when, when, usually when a new executive comes in, they want to change the vision, the values, and aims of the organisation. That tends to be a time when, when new values comes out for an organisation. Um, Asking for people what they, they, they used to try and help them come up with their values. And the one that came at the, the most, to my knowledge, none were used. There was no frameworks, no research. They just pitched in and came up with their corporate values. So that, so that was, was something that um, is useful for us to have a discussion about later on. Um, we then started to look at some potential value statements and to ask people what they thought of them. Um, how they resonated with them um, in the, the daily life of their business. Um, the ones that I've picked there and put up on, onto the first list, for the first time I asked the question, were, with things here, um, it was actually the organisational values family meaning, so I put Paul Ken onto there, and it's also the British Army values. So I've mixed them up purely because I've done some work on the Aberdeen ones, and I have been doing some work um, with Sandhurst as well on, on British Army values. And 
it was just to get an initial people starting to think about what sort of words would they want in, in, in their value statements. Um, we then had more open questions. So we asked people more openly, you know, what would you have? What are the words that are missing? What are the values that you see in your organisation? And we asked it in two different questions. So we asked it initially, and then we asked it again in question 23, just to see if it changed what people's responses were. Um, the top ones, I guess, are sort of benevolent values, I would say. And it was interesting to see the responses that people came back with. Talking about service, safety came through quite strong with the companies that was mentioned. Um, equity and equality came through um, service to others in, in, in that top sphere. But there was a continual going back to business needs to make needs to make money and it needs to be profitable. That was something that kept on coming back to. I love this response here. Somebody said shareholder value. That needs if that doesn't feature the organisation isn't working. So so that was something that came through. Um, and, and those more open questions. And then um, we started to ask people about um, what they saw the values for. Because it's not always clear in an organisation. Usually it's just done as a process. But why are we doing it? Is it a set of rules for the company to work towards? Was it something you can put into disciplinary codes? Is it something you can... You can members of staff out that are not performing because actually you don't fit the values construct or is it an enabler but actually it's something to help promote <coughs> success um, within the, the organization is it cultural and um, so we started to put it through different lenses and um, there was no one which came through as a, 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 as a strong theme but it was just interesting to see the different responses to that and for people to actually think well, what why is it we do it is it a rules-based thing? Is it a compliance thing? Is it an enabling thing? Um, and is it something that's absolute? Are, are these just the values and you have to follow them? Or is there different ways of which we, we can work within the organisation? Um, we asked at two different points. One about um, values that resonate with you as a person, and then we asked about values that resonate with your organisation. And it's really interesting to look at having done this now in business, um, with the military and with the public service. Um, both the military and the um, business sector, self-indulgent comes through as a strong theme. Now, I don't know if people are misinterpreting that or if they're just being quite honest and saying, yeah, there is a self-indulgent way of working there. And that's, that's the way in which we operate. And it's both something that comes through strongly in our personal values and within the business as well. So that was one theme that was interesting um, that came through. Big difference between um, equity, forgiving, loyalty, respect for others and social justice within what people were personally saying and what they saw in their business. So we start to see tensions between people's personal values and what they're doing at their work. Now, in a business sense, that's interesting. Now, how do you corral the troops, if you like? How do you get them working with the set values? In a military context, that is a significant issue. If personal values are starting to go a different direction from the organisational values, that is a, a, obviously operational consequences. And when we did the work with the army, we looked at some of the challenges that the German military in particular is having just now. They're having significant challenges in trying to get everyone at every rank uh, corralled around about the same values because there's a politicisation within the German army at the senior ranks. Um, and that's causing all sorts of problems. Um, Merkel is trying to put through a <coughs> new values code for all um, public servants in Germany. And she's been blocked by a group who would be deemed to be almost right wing in their, in, in their leanings. And they don't want that sort of control because they see the values that the, the, the German state will put in um, are about control and are about ways to get rid of people out of the organisation. So that's a, 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 a challenge that we are going through just now. Um, and you can see that, that tension. Um, 
we then had a, a number of open questions, um, and, and it was interesting as well. Never, never be afraid to rock the boat. It was it was a strong one, which was was quite interesting to see, and uh, people quite quite keen to, to have transformational leadership, disruptive leadership, um, should be in there. Um, and then we, we, we sort of tried to put these responses together. Um, we saw some people starting to fly up, actually. Yeah. We, we like our organisation, we, we, we've got strong values in, in our organisation. Others, quite clear, there's, there's a wide variance. There was one person who gave a response and they talked about all the range of companies that worked in. It was too long to put into, into to, to, to this. Um, and they talked about the very different values that they'd seen in, in different places. Um, the bottom one, um, they're hype, they're just something that's done. Um, I'd be interested to see how the organisation works, how, how does that operate, um, if that is how um, they conduct their business. But again, we go back to this profitability. At the very bottom there, we saw this, this harnessing back to shareholder value, which we, we can understand. So that first comes to the other side. Future thoughts on that. Um, from our work on values, um, we wonder how organisations then come about with the discussion, the framing, and most of the operationalising of their values. So it's all very well to have it up there, but how does it actually um, look in practice? There's a couple of future thoughts there. Um, I guess when you're going back to your organisations, what are the extant values? Do they need revised? Does this, as a starting point, it's only a starting point, does it help you to have a more informed um, conversation? And then, as we start to think about our move into the second part of the presentation and social media, automated world, how will that change? How will values and organisations change, if at all, as we go into an automated world? And I'm going to pause there before we go into the, the sort of Twitter part, just to ask any reflections overall on, on, on what um, you guys have fed into us with the questionnaire, but more so on these headings here, any reflections? Does that sound like what you're seeing in business? Or is that something you're not in it? Yeah? I think that one for me is <coughs> profitability is, I wouldn't see the value, it's an outcome of the value rather than an actual value itself. Yeah. Because I think it's a given if you're in business, mm -hmm. it's a good shareholder return and, and, and value. So profitability is a core part of that. So does that help us to separate out clarity on aims, yeah. values, behaviours, rather than something but rather things like profitability? Yeah. E excellence is the one that excellence just narrates me. What is excellence? And it goes into this value, but it's not really a value, is it? It's an aim. And even then, it's a, it's a pretty aim isn't it? Yeah. Well, that was, I mean, it's interesting kind of rough uh, data, um, but because you know, there's a lot of interest in these values-based business and a lot of the big companies think see themselves as thought leaders are really engaged in this mm -hmm. and they've kind of moved on from this because you talked about you know sort of the softer values and uh, you know the harder but yeah. the reality is that lots of those soft values are commercial you know the whole notion of triple bottom line companies and the mm -hmm. this focus on the environment and transparency yeah. as much as the bottom line that millennials and gen z are interested in companies who have overt values mm -hmm. and do good as well as so it's interesting that clearly that maybe just the structure of the questionnaire but there didn't seem to be much of a because like that quote and obviously it was an anecdote about it's only you know only profit yeah, yeah. the reality is profit will only be sustained if companies move towards a more transparent value set because most yeah. customers now want that you know if your company makes a profit but then it helps to you know, destroy the world and yeah. then, um, you know, you will have questions to answer uh, mm -hmm. eventually. So it's interesting the way that it's beginning to be picked up in this kind of capitalism 2.0 sort of yeah. world where values are now seen as part of the commercial process and not just some kind of nice greenwashing activity that, you know, makes you look good for the public. Then uh, well, <coughs> social media and 24-7 um, news content, if you're not operating in a values-based way and something hits crisis comms point, Everyone knows about it. Well, it was, uh, this, 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 this last week, there was a story about a housing estate in London, which mm -hmm. is a public-private or social-private mix, and the uh, estate managers have repartitioned the ground so that 
the people in the sort of affordable housing, their children can no longer play in the main play areas for the owners only. And this caused a bit of a, a storm online. And uh, the company who manage it uh, don't have a Twitter account, mm -hmm. but the uh, vice um, some director, whatever she was, who was quoted, does have a personal Twitter feed. Okay. Which, of course, people like me found within five <laughs> minutes of yeah. uh, public going, going of the story. And so yeah. suddenly, so it does, it absolutely um, you know, speaks to what you're going to talk about next, which is mm -hmm. all of this flows immediately into the real world and damages your business if you aren't thinking yeah. about it. Yeah, the issue of a different type of employee coming in, sometimes even more organisations thinking about particular their own values. Um, again, the military is a classic example of that because their value codes were based on something they started thinking about 10, 20 years ago. <coughs> even within that time frame, the, the type of people that they're recruiting now are very, very different and they're looking for something different and they need to be recruited, trained, and, and retained in a very different way, usually linked to how they are person how do they personal experience work, that interface between work and, and, and personal life now is blurred. And, and as a result of that, there, there, there's a lot more thinking about um, you know, if it, if it doesn't fit for me, I'm walking up going somewhere else. And that's certainly something that's, that's coming through. Anyone else want to pick up any more reflections? Can I have a deal for time? Am I okay for time just now? Yeah, okay. Hey, Twitter, I'm not just talking about Twitter, now. that's good, isn't it? <laughs> it's, uh, it well, it's, yeah, because, yeah, um, rather than be talking for 20 minutes, we'll try, try and get a good, um, better balance in the second half. So, reach of Twitter, as you just said, we, we, we know only too well. Again, I was just going on the way up in the train last night, um, just reminding myself of some of the key figures there, both political um, and um, some of the, the sort of business figures in terms of their reach. Um, Fascinating that Bill Gates well outstrips Theresa May, even with Brexit, which has just not been followed as much as what we'd, we'd think there. Um, so quite, quite a, a, a stark um, difference. Bill Gates almost got as many as, as President Trump. Um, there was lots we could, we could say about that. Um, Lord Sugar, own British um, businessman, got very similar um, numbers to 10 Downing Street. So business leaders, obviously, as popular as, as, as political on the social media um, world. Obama still strips. You know, Obama's got one of the, the highest um, Twitter followings. There is, of course, a question mark about how much of that is true Twitter followers or how much that's automated systems helping to, to boost his numbers. But that's a, a separate conversation altogether about Mechanical Turk and, and, and how that works. Um, the paper I put out, I mean, as I said, it's just a purely a speculative. How many have read the blog piece? How many have read the blog? You read it, yeah. A couple have read it. Um, it was purely a speculative thing. We just started to see this trend. People seem to be using Twitter, um, one, as a, a sort of starting point to horizon scan and to get a sense of what's going on out there. It's a great tool for building a, a good sense of what's happening in your sphere, in the market. And, and, and knowing what's going on, and knowing so instantly, and um, things are th th things are changing. So that was the starting point. And um, people seem to be using it to share their vision, values, and aims. They seem to be using that as a way in which they were harnessing, particularly big organisations, multiple locations, how they were seeing what the executive and the management was doing. Um, it was also being used as um, a way to celebrate success, a way to close off when things go well. Sometimes the nature of social media, of course, is self-publicity. Sometimes over, you know, over, it's overly so in terms of everything's positive, everything's great. But you're not going to put it in social media when you're having a bad day. It's not the nature of social media to do that. But that was coming through. Um, but then we started to see as well people use them um, for um, sort of negotiation and buffering and moving of, 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 of influence and ideas. I guess the most extreme example of that is one president tweeting another president and calling them rocket man, which just changed the whole dynamic completely in terms of international negotiation. And again, when we had our chap over from NATO, and um, we were keen to have a conversation about that in terms of, of social media negotiation and international relations. We've never seen anything like that before, for somebody to call somebody rocket man on, on, on Twitter, Ch changed the whole, whole, whole dynamic. So, from the, the, the piece, I tried to separate out in terms of um, uh, ways in which Twitter can be um, a, a 
positive views and ways in which it obviously can cause problems. I tried to look for other academic papers um, on Twitter and the impact of Twitter within management. And actually, there's not very much written about it just now. So there's obviously an area that people are, are, are just catching up in terms of the academic world. I could only find one paper um, explicitly on it. And believe it or not, it was called the same title as my blog. I promise you, I didn't steal it, OK? But it was called Leading by Tweeting. It was exactly the same title. But it was about higher education. It was about university principals using Twitter as a means to manage their organisations. How were they using um, their, their, their own personal um, feeds? That leads us into a text <coughs> on the thing because you have your personal Twitter account, but clearly you also have um, working ones as well. And again, going back to the, the discussion about that blend between your own life and your working life becoming more and more blurred, but how does that work on, on, on Twitter? Um, so that's a, a starting point. I guess the bottom part um, is, 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 a, is one that we all know too well. There's no substitute for one-to-one for -one discussion um, and, and, and having that um, uh, emotionally intelligent discussion with, with customers and stakeholders. I guess if we go back to all of our Twitter feeds and review our own Twitter feeds, one, what values are coming through from our own messaging we're putting out, and also how are we emotionally intelligent in terms of who we're connecting with, if we're connecting with anyone, because Twitter is just a a vast universe of shouting from the rooftop and hoping that somebody picks up the, the, the message you've been putting out. I'll pause there just now um, and we'll maybe just do a quick table discussion just now if that's okay. I believe you guys are as well as I don't know if you will to join these guys on one, how are we using um, Twitter just now and can it be used to lead with a values based approach? Can Twitter be, be used? as a values-based leader, um, and, and then we'll come back and, and take some feedback if that's, that's okay. <laughs>